Now, Easter Sunday is usually one of the largest attended Sundays of the year. And pastors will think, you know, preachers will think, you know, what should I teach on this Sunday? What did Jesus say whenever he had the largest crowds? We want people to come back. And so sometimes we try to make the message as pleasing as possible. So what did Jesus say on his Easter weekends? What did he say to make people come back? As I looked through this, what I discovered was quite interesting. Whenever we read about large crowds that are following Jesus, and he said something that made most of them leave, not stay. Here's what I want you to see today. Jesus gave people the uncomfortable truth. No matter who they were, no matter how many were there, he spoke the truth. And when he was done preaching, done speaking, done teaching, the majority of the crowd was not looking to come back. Let me give you a few examples. John chapter 6. <coughs> he was speaking to a crowd of at least 5,000, probably double that, maybe even triple, because the scripture says it was 5,000 men. So we know there was more than that. But this is what he said. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Awkward, uncomfortable words, even today. To eat his flesh, drink his blood, we're not cannibals. But he used this language to get their attention to make this point. Life is found only in him. True life. A few verses later in, in that chapter, in verse 66, he's been speaking, he's told the people this, and then it says, from this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Many of his disciples. Disciples is a person who follows the teachings of another. In here we always think of disciples as being Christian. That's not necessarily so. A disciple is just a person who follows the teachings of some, some person, some other person. His disciples began to leave. Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse 55, is another story. Large crowds were traveling with him. He turned to them and he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. To hate your mother and father, your brother and sister, to hate even your own life, what was he saying? I think he was saying, if I'm just one of many, don't bother. If you're not going to follow me, then it's... If you are going to follow me, then it's, it's not enough for me just to be in first place. I have to be the one and only. If you're too concerned about what your family will think to follow me, then go back home. If you'd rather go out with your friends than worship me, then just forget it. And by the way, part of following me may mean you have to carry your own cross. The crowd started to leave. You almost see his disciples standing off to the side saying, what is he saying? We've worked so hard to get these people here to hear him. Or maybe someone in the crowd is thinking, doesn't he know I brought a friend to church today? He's going to scare him away. But whenever Jesus had large crowds, in fact, whenever he had anybody listening to him, he always gave them the uncomfortable truth. So today we're going to look at a couple of uncomfortable truths. There'll be four of them. Remember when Pilate interrogated Jesus? He asked the people the ultimate question. What should I do with Jesus? Pilate eventually dealt with Jesus by washing his hands. I think he did that because he understood the implications that it would have on his own life if he believed that Jesus was who he said he was. Pilate knew it would change everything in his life, so he washes his hands. The problem is it's not really a, an option. You can't wash your hands of Jesus any more than somebody standing on the edge of a cliff can wash their hands of gravity. 
The question of what will you do with Jesus cannot be ignored. You now, sometimes we give answers like, you know, this way I'm not ready. Those are still no answers. See, as far as Christ is concerned, it's either yes or no. You either accept him or reject him. So John chapter 11, if you want to follow along in your Bible, I don't know the verse. So, just watch the screen. All the scriptures up there. Story about Lazarus. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now Lazarus is sick to the point of death. There's nothing else that can be done for him. The doctors of the day were out of options. But his friend is Jesus. And he's such a friend that the sisters don't even tell Jesus who it is. They just say, the one you love is sick. And Jesus knew who, exactly who it was. Lazarus is not going to get better. There's nothing anyone can do. He needs to be saved. So that brings us to the uncomfortable truth number one. We need to be saved. Imagine you're sailing out on the ocean. Nice boat. But all of a sudden this big storm comes up. <clears throat> tosses the boat around. Eventually knocks you overboard. You're out there floating in the water. Somehow you manage to keep your cell phone dry. You open it up, and you find out you've got reception, but all of a sudden the low battery light comes on. Who are you going to call? What are you going to ask for? Do you ask for food? And you know there's not a whole lot to eat out there. Maybe water, because you can't drink salt water. Maybe you're going to call and ask this person that you've been dating for quite a while to marry you because you really wanted to do that before you died. Maybe you're going to ask for a bigger house because you need one. I don't think those things would cross your mind. The first thing that would come out of your mouth would be, help me. Is there someone out there that can save me? I think the reason we don't always ask that question is because we don't realize we're drowning. We don't understand that we have a need to be saved. The Bible says that all have sinned. All have sinned. One thing that everybody in this room has in common, we have all sinned. The Bible also says that the punishment for our sins is death. Not just physical death. That is the result of sin. Everyone will die. But our sins condemn us to a spiritual death. An eternal death. Eternal separation from God. Which is a more comfortable way of saying hell. Hell is described as a place, a horrible place of outer darkness. Where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said hell is a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The truth is, all of us have sinned. And unless we're somehow saved, that is our reality. Now even though the Bible teaches us, a lot of people don't believe it. Sad to say a lot of people in church don't believe it either. The reason they don't believe it is because they don't want to. Maybe you're thinking, well, I believe in God, but I don't believe in a God who would send people to hell. Go ahead and think that if you want, but what if that is a wrong understanding of who God is? Let's imagine, and this is strictly pretend. This past week, you saw me sitting in a restaurant, candlelit dinner, with some woman that wasn't gay. I hope you spoke up. <laughs> We did. <laughs> you come over and you say, who is this? What's going on here? And I say, well, I'm just not a date. And you say, well, what about Kay? And I just say, well, I still love her. It's okay. You walk away angry and disgusted. You decide that she needs to know about it. 
So before you even have the building, you're on your cell phone calling her, telling her what was going on. So I go home, meet her at the door, and she says, Hi, honey, did you have a nice time in your day? I say, you know that I was on a date? And she says, yeah, but I still love you. How absurd. If I walked in that front door, I'd be in fear of my life, <laughs> let alone my marriage. Now, if Kay learned that I was at McDonald's eating with a man that kind of had long hair and kind of looked like a, a woman, I'd probably be in trouble for that, too. But I, I could choose to believe that Kay would accept that. You know, it's okay. But I know that a real wife would not respond that way. And she would have a whole lot more to say. So there is only one true God. And he has made it very clear that the wages of sin is death. He still loves us, but he hates the sin. Any other God is, is a pretend God. Something that we imagine he would be like. Because that's what we want. The truth is, we need to be saved. Which leads us to the uncomfortable truth number two. We can't save ourselves. But how often do we try? Even as Christians, we continue to try to fix things. You know, there have been all kinds of surveys done, and almost everybody thinks they're going to go to heaven. And when they're asked why, it's because, well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a pretty good person. I deserve to go to heaven. I do more good than I do bad. It's hard for us to accept the fact that that we need help from someone else. Excuse me. I don't know if you can hear it, but I can hear that echo. It works all just great until it's time for the service. Okay. We cannot save ourselves. No matter how good we try to be, no matter what we try to do, we just cannot do it. Show me after the movie, uh, The Passion of the Christ, was released. Comedian Bill Maher talked about it on his show. And to his credit, he said that it was a moving and challenging movie to him. But here was his faulty conclusion. I just don't get it. The thought of someone else cleansing me of my sins is ridiculous. I don't need anyone to cleanse me. I can cleanse myself. And the crowd burst into applause. I can understand why we think that way. But what if it's not true? What if what God says is true? See, the truth is, according to God, you cannot earn salvation. You cannot be good enough to make it to heaven. Now, I understand you're a good person. You do nice things. But the Bible, God's written word, says that all the sin and the penalty for sin is one that none of us can pay for. Back to Lazarus. Didn't have much time left. His sister sent word to Jesus, hoping that he would return and save their brother. And verse 6 in John 11 tells us that when Jesus heard about Lazarus, he left immediately and went to him. That's not what it says. It says he stayed for two more days. And then when Jesus and his disciples finally got there, we read that Lazarus had been dead and in the tomb for four days. Now there were friends and family with Mary and Martha. It's a heartbreaking scene. Many of us have experienced death and funerals. Everyone is weeping and crying. Verses 20 through 22 say that when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. You know, she's asking, will you bring him back to life? 
Several verses of the Bible have, have Martha saying this way, if only you had been here. If only you had been here. Have you had some of those if only moments? When God didn't come through, when God didn't do what you thought he should, how would you finish that statement? God, if only you had. How many times have you felt like God let you down? So here's a truth that doesn't often get talked about. Just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean that life is easy. Or put uncomfortable truth number three this way. Sometimes Jesus doesn't save the way we think he should. If only he would have kept my parents together. If only he would have given us a child. If only he would have made those tests come back negative. If only you would have given me that job. If only you would have let me win that $640 million jackpot last week. If only you would have saved our marriage. If only you would find me a spouse. If only, if only, we have all these things that we think Jesus should do our way. Martha wasn't alone. Verse 37 says that some of the Jews were mourning, said, could, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? <clears throat> Maybe you've wondered from time to time, if God can, then why doesn't he? Maybe you've become a little bit disillusioned with God, with Christianity, with the church. You can still call yourself a Christian, but to be honest, if you look at your relationship with Jesus, it's like it's like the cousin you see only at Easter and Christmas. I know sometimes in an effort to build a crowd and get people to come back, some churches, some, some preachers are guilty of teaching that if you follow Jesus, all of your problems will be solved. So we get these ideas that we think Jesus should save, should solve all my problems in the way I want them done. But it seems like all of our ideas of salvation always focus on the temporary, on the here and now. So like Martha, we have our own ideas of how God should answer our prayers. Ideas that stretch all the way from opening a space in a crowded parking lot, to funding our retirement dreams, to straightening out our kids, to giving us a negative biopsy. We tend to think of salvation as something that we get on this side of the grave. We're thinking about the temporary, the, the earthly. Martha is focused on the temporary, on the earthly. But Jesus had something in mind that went far beyond that. Verse 23, Jesus says to Martha, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She thinks that Jesus is just telling her, you know, He's gone on to a better place. You'll see him again someday. It's what is said at funerals quite often, because we don't know what else to say. But she's not talking to anybody else. She's talking to Jesus. In verses 25 and 26, he makes this claim about himself. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Quite often we leave off that last statement. You know, we like that I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live. But then Jesus asks, do you really believe this? That's the ultimate question we phrase. Do you believe that this Jesus is the resurrection and the life? With this one statement, Jesus is not only claiming to be God, I am. That was God's name from the Old Testament, Yahweh. He's making two other important claims. Number one, he claims to be the life. Not a life, the life. The Bible says that everything we need for real life and real living is found in him only. And then he claims to be the resurrection, the eternal life. I don't know if you saw the 60-minute interview with New England Patriot quarterback Tom Brady. By age 28, he had already won three Super Bowls, dated supermodels and actresses, was on the cover of multiple magazines. But in an interview 
Brady spoke of his hunger. He said, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life. But me, I think, gosh, it's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't, this, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. As successful as he was in man's eyes, he knew there was something missing. Maybe you hear that and you think, well, I thought that was it. I thought that was life. See, Jesus says, I am the life. I am what you were created for. I am what you have been searching for. And he says, I am the resurrection. In other words, he's saying, I am the one who has power over death. I am the one that gives eternal life. Do you believe this? That's a question you're going to have to answer. Look at Martha's response. She says, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. She may say, I believe that you are the Messiah, God. Jesus walks over to the tomb and he says, take away the stone. Notice Martha's objection. He's been there for four days. The odor is going to be terrible. He stinks. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man hopped out. How many of you picture in your mind Lazarus walking out? He didn't walk out. He had to hop out because he was still wrapped up in his grave clothes. Wrapped up like a mummy. Because when he came out, Jesus told them, to unwrap him, let him loose. Take off his grave clothes. And the funeral turns into a party. Weeping gives way to celebration. Jesus says, I am. I am the resurrection. <coughs> Excuse me. I am the life. If you believe in me and put your trust in me, you will live forever. I promise. If you believe in Christ, put your faith in him, you will live forever. Let me qualify that. You will live with him forever in heaven. From the moment of conception, every human being lives forever. Here's the ultimate uncomfortable truth, number four. Jesus alone can save. Maybe that makes you feel uncomfortable. But that truth is a reason to celebrate. We need to be saved. We can't save ourselves. The Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. See, all of us will have a day like Lazarus. A day where we will die. And that time is coming for every one of us. A lot of people try to delay it in all kinds of ways, but eventually the clock runs down. But here's the good news. This story from John 11 isn't just a story from some 2,000 years ago about a man who died and came back to life. It's a whole lot more than that. It's a preview of what is to come. It's a promise. It's a hope that one day we too will conquer death. Not long after this, Jesus was arrested. He was beaten. He was put to death for our sins. But on the third day, this day that we celebrate, he rose from the dead. He conquered death so that we could live with him. And because he conquered death, we will live forever. Eternal life in the presence of God. If and only if we accept this truth. See, he, his conquering death defeated death for every human being, whether you're a Christian or not. But by accepting what he did, you have eternal life in heaven. In the video in Sunday School this morning, he says, when a man walks out of his own grave, he is whoever he says he is, and whatever he says is true. I have to alter that a little bit. Because there is a prophecy about a man who's going to die and come back to life and claim to be Christ. So to make this statement true is when a man walks out of his own grave to never die again. He is whoever he says he is and whatever he says is true. See, Lazarus died again. 
Jesus brought them back to life. All the ones in the Old Testament were brought back to life, all died again. When you read Scripture, you find out when, when Jesus rose from the dead, there were other tombs that were opened up, and people from the dead came to life and walked around. That's often looked over during this time. We can't explain it, so we ignore it. But it's in Scripture. Every one of those people died again. But Jesus didn't. He conquered death once and for all. Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. True truth, absolute truth. You will live forever, eternal life, in one of two places, with God or without God, in heaven or in hell. See, you get to choose. Can't blame anyone else. It's your choice alone. Next week, I'm going to begin a series dealing with eternal life. Taking a glimpse of an eternal life and how our life here on earth now affects our life in eternity. But for right now, I want you to think about this ultimate question. What will you do with Jesus? Whether you're a Christian or not, what are you going to do with Jesus? Even, see, even as Christians, sometimes we begin the process, but then we set him aside and we go on living our life. That's not what he died on the cross for. How will you answer that question? Father God, we, we bow before you because you are God. Not just our buddy, not just this Jesus who, who loves us and we've turned into this friend that we just go kick about with, but you're God, the creator. And you made some rules. Father, I pray that each one of us will allow you to speak to our hearts this morning, not just our heads. And that we will be honest enough with you to either say yes or no and not make excuses. For those of us who have already accepted you, I pray that we will be honest enough to say, I have not allowed you to be the one and only. Maybe we haven't even allowed you to, to be first. Father, speak to us. Change us.